Well, hello there, and welcome to this little guide on radiosity for Lightwave 11. In this video, we're going to be introducing you to using the global illumination system, what all of the different settings are for, and how we tweak them to get the kind of renders that we're after. Once you're done here, if you're wanting to go further, then pop on over to cmivfx.com, which is a training site with lots of videos for lots of different packages, who have published a second part to this whole radiosity thing in which we look at animated radiosity with Lightwave and the kinds of tricks and techniques we can use to get nice renders with it. Alternatively, if you've already got that tutorial from CMI and you've been directed here to watch this little introduction, then welcome. We'll get right on with it. So just before we get into the uh, details here of the radiosity system, there are just a couple of little starter points for things that will help you out as you get further in. First of all, you'll notice that I'm using a very plain scene. No surfaces, no shaders, nothing. It's just plain grey and a bit of red on the chair here. It is often, when doing radiosity, a good idea to just set up a copy of your scene with these basic surfaces. No textures or anything. It makes it much easier to see the problems and the errors and to correct for them. It also, of course, gives you faster rendering times whilst you're doing those tests. It's your colour space to get proper lighting and so forth out of radiosity you do need to be using the correct color space. Basically, if you're unsure of color space, just use the sRGB preset here. Why? Doesn't matter, just do it. Another thing, really important, watch your geometry. You see here on this fill, I've got this little lip down here at the bottom where it's just a smooth, rounded corner. Looks lovely, doesn't play so nice with radiosity because it's right in contact here with the ground. It's a difficult place for rays to get into. Not that many will, and as such, it won't shade so brilliant. Instead, something like this, where it's nice and flat, will give you a much better result. Also, watch out for protruding geometry. If you've got your room here, say, and you've got a box coming into it, if the top side of this box outside the room is receiving illumination from the outside, then that illumination may bleed through to the inside, and you'll get a light leak. So with those little basics taken care of, we can then actually get in and start doing our radiosity setup. So the first thing to know then about using radiosity in Lightwave is the four types of light that radiosity is able to light our scenes with. These four types are ambient light, that we're all well used to, backdrop lighting, which is basically anything in your backdrop panel, so a backdrop colour, gradient, textured environment, image world and so on. All of that is like a light in your scene, and the radiosity can use that. You then have, of course, real lights in this scene here. We've got a, um, a DP infinite light is the light that we're using. Just one light in this test scene. There you are, real lights. And then, of course, you've got luminous geometry, none of which do I currently have at the minute, but, of course, if I wanted to, I could have a nice light-up chair like that. So those are the four types of light. And the radiosity engine achieves different results with each of them. For instance, the cleanest and the easiest and the quickest to render is ambient light, then, of course, backdrop light, then real light, and then luminous geometry. OK, so then, let's look at the different types of radiosity that we have. Obviously, we have to enable it, and we've got these three different types here. Backdrop, Monte Carlo, and Final Gather. OK, backdrop only. Backdrop only radiosity is single bounce only, it doesn't do multi bounce. You'll notice that the bounces have become greyed out, or single ray rather. It casts one ray from the backdrop, and there you go. As such, backdrop only radiosity won't take lighting from lights or luminous geometry. You can only use it with ambient and background illumination. Then you have the other two, Monte Carlo and Final Gather. Just as a side note to the backdrop before we move on completely, if you use either of these modes, and you also use some form of backdrop illumination, then you can get multi-bounce backdrop illumination without using any kind of lights or other such. What you can't get is multi-bounce ambient illumination. Ambient illumination is always one ray maximum. OK, so Monte Carlo then. Monte Carlo's pretty much the highest quality setting to use. Very good, does multiple bounces, very nice, and there you go. Final Gather, pretty much the same sort of thing. It tends to be a little weaker than Monte Carlo. It's slightly quicker, but the shading pattern is slightly different. Lots of folks tend to just prefer the Monte Carlo. You can normally get as good a look with Final Gather, but you've normally got to up the quality settings, which basically means 
an increase of render time. So just used generally, most people go for the Monte Carlo. But there are situations where final gather can be quite useful to us. The other thing to mention with the radiosity types is interpolated. When interpolated is turned off, we get what we call a brute force calculation for the radiosity in our scene. Basically, with brute force, the renderer takes the number of rays. I'm going to use a low number to start with here, just 10. I'm only going to use one bounce. And we'll pop out a quick render here. And what we can see is that a brute force radiosity solution behaves very much like lights and shading, in the fact that it has so many samples and it generates noise when there aren't quite enough of them. Going back elsewhere on the good old internet here, if you've not seen my video on rendering, sampling, and anti-aliasing, then you should probably check that out as well. That'll help you understand noisy renders and so on. Anyhow, brute force radiosity works much like a light, as in it comes through noisy. And to make it better, we just have to increase the number of samples, an act which unfortunately slows down our render time a lot. You can see I'm at 100 samples there. It's ticking by considerably more slowly than the last one, and yet we can see it's still quite noisy. We're not going to wait for the whole thing to complete. Interpolated is something slightly different. With interpolated radiosity, the renderer breaks down the scene into a number of evaluation points, or cells, renders these, and then smooths out the shading between them. If we were to use interpolated and crank things high enough that we were getting an evaluation per pixel, we'd basically have the same render time as a brute force. Let's punch back down to 10 again and see what we get this time. Well, you can see the cells here. And then there goes the render, and it smooths them out. And there we have it. We have a much quicker render. But, of course, what we have is this effect, which we call splotches. And this is just the interpolation that is taking place between each evaluation cell, as each cell just gets smoothed and they all blended together. Obviously, this is pretty bad too. And of course, just like Monte Carlo, we make it better by just increasing the number of rays that are used. When using interpolated radiosity, it helps to think of each cell as collecting rays. If, if you read the description in the manual and various descriptions that have been given over time, you'll see the same diagram used again and again of a little hemisphere casting out rays. A ray hits a surface and that shoots off rays in lots more directions and so on. But for the purposes of thinking about it, and treating this as some kind of quality setting. You should think of the evaluation cells that you see coming up during the pass here as collecting in rays from the scene. The more they collect, the more accurately they shade. The reason you get splotches is because each cell is evaluated independently of the others. With a low ray count, one cell may happen to shade lighter because it's picking up a light ray from somewhere, and the next cell might shade much darker because it's picking up a shadow ray from somewhere. The result of this is that you get two neighbouring cells with a contrast between them, and that's what your splotches are. You can see here in our render, we haven't got a different number of cells drawn. The splotches are no different in size, but the shading between each one and its neighbours is more uniform. And this continues to increase as we up our number of rays. And that basically is interpolated radiosity for. And you can use this interpolated mode on any of the radiosity types, as well, of course, as with any of the different light types. The interesting one here is final gather. When interpolated is on, it behaves in much the same way as Monte Carlo did. However, when interpolated is off, final gather shows its second characteristic difference from Monte Carlo. And that is the fact that the first bounce becomes brute force, but the subsequent bounces, if we had multi-bounce radiosity, subsequent bounces are then interpolated. And you can see, of course, we've now got a ray count for secondary bounces, not because they're interpolated, but just because we've got multiple bounces. And so using final gather with interpolated mode off can give you a mix of both. One brute force bounce, so a much more accurate first bounce, and generally it's the first bounce that is the most important, and then interpolated secondary bounces to help speed up the overall render. Again, we see this quick F9 at 100 and 100. We see the pre-pass, which is, of course, its rendering of the second bounce. And then we can see this noisy render crawling in over the top, which is the mixture of the interpolated GI and the brute force GI. And of course, the render time works out somewhere in between. As you can see, this is taking a little while to render 
And I'm not particularly minded to wait around for it, but irrespective of that, we can see here in the preview window some of the little errors that we're getting with our low settings here on Final Gather. What you'll find is that Monte Carlo has a tendency to produce shadow splodges, little splodges of dark, whereas Final Gather tends more to produce little splodges of light, as we see here. Obviously, as we turn up our settings, those minimize. But that's the key visual difference that you can often find between the two. As a result, I tend not to like Final Gather too much for doing interiors. In interiors, it's always shadow areas that are problematic, and so cleaning up a shadow in a shadowed area is much easier. In outdoor situations, the converse is usually true, because you've got lots of light everywhere, so it's much easier to hide bright splodges. Which, of course, brings me on to the different types of scene that you'll render with radiosity, um, which come into three basic camps. You've got your exterior, buildings and streets and whatnot. You've got your interiors, rooms like this. And then, of course, you've got your studio lighting shots where you don't really have much of an interior, you've just got a simple flat background. What you'll find is that for the external stuff, backdrop only works out really well, um, so can Final Gather. For studio stuff, um, backdrop can also work really well, um, or Monte Carlo, and if you're using Monte Carlo on a studio shot or Final Gather external shot, you really very, very rarely need to go above like one bounce sometimes up to two. For interiors though, Monte Carlo is the one to go with and of course however many bounces you find you need. The other thing worth pointing out whilst I'm talking about those little details uh, is this little tool, Radiosity Flags, which gives you certain things that you can show in the render itself, since nodes, samples, second bounce, and that winds up producing a render like this, which shows you what the renderer has done behind the scenes in calculating the scene. That can be helpful for troubleshooting how your radiosity is working and how it's evaluating your scene, rather than trying to determine it from the final render itself. So, that's that sorted. Let's take a look at some of the other settings we've got here then. Um, blur background, if you've got an image in the background, this just blurs it quite simply. If you've got a sharp image with hot pixels here and there, or harsh contrast between pixels here and there, then that affects the lighting, and it will cast areas of greater contrast into the lighting, which of course produces splodges. So that's what blur background is for. Side note to this as well is your light and shade samples. When using interpolated radiosity, the interpolation pre-process is done using just the base samples. If you've got a noisy light or a noisy shader, then that will scatter the radiosity samples differently. Of course, it's a noisy light, so you've got areas of light and areas of dark little pinprick pixels. Depending which of those pixels happens to catch the bounce ray will affect your shading. So you normally have to turn these up when using radiosity. Now, I don't have any shaders in here or any kind of surfaces like that, but I do have the DP infinite light, so I'll just show you this quickly. We go back down to good old 10 rays here, so it's nice and quick. You can see here the noisy light, of course. That gets cleaned up in post by adaptive sampling, but of course it was not cleaned up whilst the radiosity was pre-processing. Okay, so there's our render, very nice, very good, 42 seconds there. Now let's put our light samples up, I'm going to put them to 16 here, and that's all I'm changing, and we render again. Now we see jumped up the render time, of course, but the interesting place to note is around here, where our light is rebounding onto this wall. We compare it with the previous render, See that? It's a lot smoother with our light samples turned up, getting much less splotching there. And also, of course, some other shifts around the scene, because, of course, the light is rebouncing everywhere. But it's most noticeable right here, just at the immediate catch point next to the point of bounce itself. So there's that. That's what blur background does, and it's a good thing to do the same thing to your lights, effectively, by increasing their sampling. OK, use transparency. If that's checked, then polygons that have transparency will let radiosity light rays through. There's the old debate about what should you put in the windows of a room that you're using radiosity with and having sunlight coming through. Personally, I don't find this is really good for much. It only slows down your radiosity in such situations. I tend to go with no windows, or rather, I have a separate object which is the windows, and when rendering it, I just set it to be unseen by radiosity. That way I can have windows in the scene to catch reflections and so forth but they just have no effect.
course, if you've got transparent items in your scene, you know, glasses or whatnot, glass ornaments, then you may or may not want to use transparency. Depends how much of a focal point they really are. Volumetric radiosity, for if you've got volumetrics in the scene, like volumetric lights and so on and so forth, and particle shaders, hypervoxels and that sort of thing. Directional rays, this is for bouncing rays off reflective surfaces, so if a surface catches a bright reflection, the light should bounce off and illuminate another surface that it catches. Again, turn that on or off, increases your render time. You can often do without it. Use behind test. Um, this one is for determining whether samples are on the same plane or not. Basically, it's for getting you better accuracy when you've got polys very close to each other that lie near each other's planes. This determines whether they are in fact on the same plane or not, and whether samples should be blended between them or not. Keeping it on gives you finer detail, but at the cost of render time. Use bumps, basically. Does the radiosity respect bump maps? Does it shade bump maps with radiosity shading? Yes or no? Use gradients. This is a trick for determining where to place samples within the scene. It uses a gradient method to try and determine where samples should be placed. And it's good, and it does help keep things nice and smooth in versions 10.1 and earlier. If we're here in 11, then you'll normally want to turn Use Gradients off. 11 has a new method for determining where to place radiosity samples for interpolated pre-processing, which is tied to the new unified sampling system. Basically, if you're using the classic camera, then you can still use the Use Gradients option. Otherwise, leave it turned off. And ambient occlusion, lastly we come to. Uh, this one is particularly fun. This is your toggle for how ambient light gets used in a radiosity render. With my ambient, just back up to 100 here, going to disable my light there. We'll have ambient occlusion off, and we'll give it the quick test render. And what we see we get is, of course, the render that we would expect to get with 100% ambient. It just takes a couple of seconds longer because it's gone through and calculated a radiosity pre-process. However, if we turn ambient occlusion on and we render, we get something very different. Basically, we get ambient lighting used with the radiosity engine. It's very quick to render, and as such, it also makes a good lighting to use when you're playing around trying to get the right settings in your samples. So I often tend to go with ambient occlusion on and quite a high ambient setting. The other way, of course, to use it is if you're wanting to use fewer bounces, you turn it off, and then, of course, you have a single bounce from whatever light source you are using. So, yeah, looks pretty awful here when I'm just using the one bounce. But, of course, extra bounces do cost render time, so using just a little bit of ambient to fill in in place of a fourth or a fifth bounce or whatnot can sometimes be a good idea. The other thing to remember when using ambient occlusion, which of course is the same as when having some kind of backdrop illumination, is that for it to work and get into the scene, you do have to have openings. In a completely enclosed room, you can't use the ambient occlusion, and obviously you can't use the background, just as you wouldn't be able to use any lights that were outside of the space. So let's take a look at these settings, now that we've covered all that other stuff, to see how we go about actually getting nice, pretty renders. Well, if you're using brute force mode, then that's pretty easy. You just keep on turning up your samples until it looks good. Your rays, I should say. And that's all there is to it. Of course, don't forget to filter things out using your good old unified sampling and adaptive sampling controls. That'll help you optimize things a bit. Otherwise, expect long render times, but at least it's really easy to use. So, let's take a peek at the settings in interpolated mode. I mean, obviously, your intensity, don't know why I even mention it, how strong is it, number of bounces, raise per evaluation, as we saw, you turn that up and quality improves. Okay, angular tolerance. When Lightwave goes around placing these evaluation cells, the more flat and open a surface is, then the further apart it will space them, the larger each cell will be, and the closer together two surfaces are, the smaller it will make each evaluation. That's why, of course, our render showed all of the splotches coming up for the most part in the corners and so forth. Very smooth, curved surfaces like this. Their flatness is interpreted based on how much angular change there is from one polygon to the next. If you put in an angular tolerance of 90 degrees, then bigger, wider areas will become sampled as if they were flat, which, of course, leads to incorrect shading. You start to turn this down, 
you'll see that Lightwave starts to divide cells on curved surfaces differently, giving you more accurate shading as the light creeps around the curved surface. Minimum and maximum pixel spacing. Basically, this controls the size and spacing of the evaluations. Let me just come down to a really low ray number here, like 10. We can see there the size of the cells. Oh, blink and you miss them. Okay, we see that the floor, even though the evaluation cells were quite big, has shaded, you know, reasonably well. Obviously, it's a larger area, so the actual splotching is no better. It's just that the gradient that has been drawn between splotches has got more space to smooth itself out. Where our evaluations were small, it hasn't, and that's why we see the splotching more obviously. We'll see that if I bring my maximum pixel spacing here right down, let's say to 8 here, then obviously all of our cells we see there are much smaller. There's none bigger than 8 pixels. And here we see our render actually sort of appears worse. Splotching is much more evident on the ground here, yet the corners are no different. They're exactly the same. They already had very small evaluations. So downing our maximum pixel spacing hasn't affected them. Basically, we've got no more splotching than we did have before. The truth here is, it doesn't really matter what your maximum pixel spacing is, because Lightwave already alters the pixel spacing based on how close together surfaces come. What will make much more difference is changing the minimum pixel spacing. This will speed up your render noticeably, but it will give you far less accurate placing of evaluations, particularly, of course, in the areas where surfaces do come close together. Let's try it at 16 even. Whoa, look at that. No detail in the corners whatsoever. Much, much quicker to render, but you can see the sort of issues that we're getting there. Down here with this step, for instance. The samples aren't bleeding across between surfaces. That would be angular tolerance that would do that. Of course, it wouldn't do it from wall to floor here because it won't go higher than 90. But we can get less splotching in the corners by turning down the definition, essentially. So that's one helpful thing. But we do need to use it carefully because if we do have small details, this is a very plain room. Others with items on shelves and books and stuff with too loose a minimum pixel spacing, they just won't look shadowed anymore. Their contact shadows won't be good enough. They won't be defined. I often tend to stick with this baby at one, but you can, for some more slightly open spaces, up that a bit. I, however, would not usually go above four. So, with it back on one, let's take a look then at actually increasing our splotches, and the only way to do it is to start upping our arrays per evaluation. We've already seen it at 100, so let's try it at 500. We can see our pre-process pass is looking far better already. The gradient drawn between one evaluation and the next is much more accurate. There we go, up to a minute 41 for all those extra rays, but look at our scene, starting to look a lot better. Still some splotches off here in the far corner, and coming up the column here, the shadow from the chair. See, 500's not bad, but it's still not great. Up to 1000 we go. At this point, I'm really just going to start using VPR. In all honesty, I could have been doing it all along, but I did want to show you the cells, and how of course they work with our renders, and some of the little twitches in render time that we get. So there's our 500 rays in VPR. Let me just um, make a quick note on VPR here. Turn off draft mode. It looks awful. I usually turn half res on just because it's quicker. So 500, as we can see, it's much as it was in our render. Not really cutting it. Let's try 1,000. Yeah, almost. Still some splotching on that back wall there. Of course, we see that VPR is also rendering my lights here quite noisy, so that could be contributing a little. I reckon 1,200. Good. Yep, that's looking a lot better now. We can see there's still the odd small splotch here in VPR, but I reckon if we F9 that. We can see here in our pre-process that we're starting to get pretty smooth results. Look at this near wall here. Even just rendered in cells, it's quite smooth. And there we go, from a minute 40 on the last one to three and a half here. We can see we've still got some little splotches just noticeable up there. But everywhere else looks pretty damn good and incredibly smooth. So that's a pretty good result all round. Okay, um, so let's look at what happens when we go into multiple bounces, shall we? Let's go for four bounces here. Okay, so 1,200 primary rays and 100 secondary rays. Obviously, our scene gets a lot brighter now. And we can see, looking in VPR, that things are, you know, reasonably smooth. But still up in that back corner, we see some problem areas. So I'm just going to crack on the old limited region here. So I want to take a 
close-up look at this with the good old F9. There we are. We'll turn that on there, give it a little render. Basically, you'll notice that I'm no longer looking at the rest of the scene. I know that's nice and smooth, so I'm just looking at the one problem area that we've had. Okay, and that actually looks a little bit better than it did with the secondary bounce. This is one thing that you will see. Additional bounces used in Radiosity will help to clean up the results of the first bounce. Because, of course, our splotches are in areas of shadow, and this is bringing more light into those points. And so as the global illumination becomes more filled and more uniform, we start to get a better result. Thing is, we want to get it better. Now, we could just keep on increasing these. But, of course, how much too? And here's the funny thing about using these two settings, is that you can sort of bounce them around one another. So here I've got 1200 primary rays and 100 secondary. When I just had the 1200 with a single bounce, I was still a little bit splotchy up here. I'm going to try something a little different. What I'm going to do is, since the additional bounces improve the first by mixing with it, maybe I can get away with fewer rays. So what I'm going to do is bring this to 800. Now obviously that's straight away going to give me a worse render. I need to up these guys. Now I know that 800 on a single bounce gives me an okay-ish render, a bit of splotching here and there. But each bounce happens individually. So if I use 800 on the second bounce, and the third, and the fourth, then they should render with an equal level of quality within their own bounce. And we're seeing cleaner results already in VPR. If we go to give that the little F9, then we get this result. If we compare the two of them, I'm going to come in 200% here, try and make this easier to see. This is the 800-800, and that's the 1200-100. And we can see that they're both splotching, but in slightly different ways. This makes it difficult to figure out where the splotches are coming from, because each splotch can come from a different bounce, and that can make these figures sometimes hard to work out. Generally, here's the way that I do it, that you'll find to be a good rule of thumb. Get your primary rays to a level whereby yeah, you've maybe got a little bit of splotching left over in some far corners or whatnot. For this, that was probably somewhere around a thousand. Your secondary rays set them to about half of that number. And there you go. You look close, there are still splotches, but it's very minor. Could probably blast the heck out of that with a bit more AS, to be honest. I'm only using like 6 AA. But you compare it to the previous ones, and it's clearly got a lot more going for it pop my limited region back off there now. So basically, yeah, that's what you do. Find yourself a, a single bounce that gives you a reasonable look throughout most of your render. Set your secondary bounces to half the amount. If you want to give yourself a little speed up, maybe take your minimum pixel spacing up a scotch, maybe up to two, very rarely any higher than two. And of course, also don't forget what I don't have going on in this scene at the moment is good old bright ambience and of course, Backdrop illumination. These are very clean forms of illumination. Cleaner than the infinite light that I'm using here. I could just turn up the samples more. That would help me as well. But it tends to have a disproportional increase on your render time. So with the background and the ambience cranked up there, let's have another little look. And there we go. Lovely and smooth all round. Tiniest amount of splotching just visible off in the back there but it's pretty minuscule. So, I'm quite happy with that. Let's see if there's anything else I can do to optimize it. Well, the main thing, pretty much the only thing at this point, is going to be my multiplier, which is the one thing we haven't really looked at yet. Um, let me just set this to 50%. Well, actually, no, let me set it to even lower. Let's try it at 25%, shall we? Basically, what changing the multiplier does is it performs the pre-process part of the render at a quarter of your resolution, or 50% your resolution, you know, whatever. The one thing to remember with it is that it ties to this, and so if I've gone down to a multiplier of 25%, I'll still use 128 pixels as the max spacing. So you usually, if you're going to use the multiplier, want to change this. In this case, I've gone down to a quarter resolution, so I'd want one quarter of the pixel spacing. And there we go, we can see that the cells are rendering in at the same size as in, you know, what fraction of the total image width they're taking up. But the actual render pass itself here is of a lower resolution. But it is giving us a much improved time. I mean, that previous one that we just saw there, you know, that was 6 minutes 50 for the GI, 7 and 8 in all for the render. Uh, this is 
Less than a minute and a half and it's about to complete the GI, so big render speed increase. Super stuff, okay, minute 44. And all in all, it looks pretty good. Here's what changing your multiplier does. It will not affect your splotchies or anything like that in any way, shape or form. Um, it may help your splotchies to actually appear less noticeable um, because they get smoothed out more. The lower resolution GI pass is, of course, scaled up and projected over the full resolution, if you like. So it will smooth out any splotchies even more. So if anything, it will help to clean them up. But it does produce a couple of artifacts. If we look nice and close up here, they'll be much easier to spot. We can see here where the light is coming in through the window. Obviously, the true light is angled down, so that has a nice sharp shadow to the edge. But we can see the radiosity bounce near it, and that doesn't. And of course, it doesn't here. It doesn't line up completely. It's basically anywhere up to four pixels off. We can also see here this slight pattern of splotches in a nice even step across there. This is, of course, where in the low resolution render we've had a couple of cells of slightly different shading that's been scaled up and so what you're seeing here is the banding of the lines of pixels from the lower resolution those lines being scaled up in width so you do get little errors like that from it but that is all and they are easy to fix in Photoshop so if you are trying to crack out a ArcViz render for something and it's taking ages it can be a really good idea just to lower your multiplier and then just fix up those little edges in Photoshop if indeed they're really that noticeable at all. Other little optimizations beyond that um, well you have per object GI so for instance the bathtub here if I go to its global illumination options you see use global is checked. If I uncheck that I can change this to something else. The bathtub rendered pretty well I don't think I really needed a full 1000 rays on it I'm gonna say 800 and of course half of that amount 400. Maybe I wanted the pixel spacing to be a little tighter on that, so I could say 16 as well there. So like that, you can add little customizations and optimizations on a per object basis, so as you don't end up wasting samples and rays where you don't need to. Lastly, let's check out the cache, because the cache is really cool. Basically, turn on the cache, uh, choose a file location for it, somewhere half decent, uh, and leave the preprocess set to automatic now. You'll notice there's a couple of different modes. Um, automatic, Lightwave will do what it thinks it needs to do. Always, it will always pre-process no matter what's been stored. It will create new processes. Never, it won't do anything. Unlocked, um, it will only use what exists in the cache. Basically, when you cache, the pre-process part of the render gets saved and that can be reused afterwards. For instance, here's our scene and let's just render it. Okay, so there we have it, our GI at minute 20, render time at a minute 37. Um, we can just close that little fella off. Um, let's just straight away hit render again. You see that bingo, our radiosity is already done and it begins rendering straight away, basically because it's cached. The thing about the cache though, is that what it is caching is the scene. It's caching the space and the geometry not your camera. See what happens if you grab your camera and move it, let's say I bring it around over here and I look, you know, let's say here instead and I render it, is it renders really fast with the cache but it becomes a mix of good and awful. Basically all of the stuff that the camera could see from its previous angle looks good and all of the stuff that it couldn't looks awful because of course that only got some basic sampling with everything being bounced around. Even though I only rendered from the one angle, the radiosity solution was computed and baked for the full scene. What I want, if I want to update this, is I just hit bake radiosity frame. And we see that this is able to use the existing samples, just adding new ones, and so the pre-process goes by much quicker, and of course when you render it's now absolutely correct. And I can basically just move my camera around the scene here, looking at stuff and baking it from new angles. So if I leave my radiosity cache turned on, when I'm doing my test renders going around, you know, positioning my camera here, there, looking for my angles and whatnot, then what basically happens is you just build up more and more and more samples into the cache that gives you quicker and quicker renders each time and the radiosity pre-process only calculates the additional samples that it needs to view the scene properly from that new angle. I can set up different angles on different frames if I like and use bake radiosity scene to just have Lightwave step through and bake all of them off in one run. There we go, a new angle which I render from, 11 seconds for GI, 
and a lovely render out of it. I can also use this method to help clean up samples in some areas if they're being a bit problematic. So I can come over here to where those ripples were at the top of the wall there, Baker View, to acquire some new samples for this area. Get my camera back over here somewhere, render from this point of view. There we can see that's cleaned that up around there. Oh, but look, new samples are needed up here and inside the bathtub where I hadn't rendered before. Bake those. There we go. And I can add more cameras with different resolutions and have them somewhere or other in my scene and I can use them to render using the same cache. See, they just pick up the cache data that is there already. You can do some more baking to update for them, their angles. And there you have it. The one thing that you cannot do is start moving or changing other stuff, okay? You can't move objects, you can't move lights, or anything of that nature. If you do want to, then you have to go back and clear the radiosity cache. Technically speaking, I mean, you don't have to. If I take our light here and I rotate it like this, and let's say I'm going to change its color as well, then when you render, uh, what you get is this. It still uses the existing cache, and it just blends the altered light on top of it. It doesn't take account of the changes. You see, look, I'm still getting this upcast onto this wall from where the light was a moment ago. It all looks nice enough, but it's clearly wrong, so that's something you can't do. Also, changing surfaces. For instance, the chair. Let's make him green. I mean, we can change his colour, and he's picked up his radiosity shading just fine. You know, he's shaded no problem. But if we look at the ground, we're still getting a red colour cast, a colour bleed, so that hasn't updated. He is still reflecting red into the scene. So yes, you can go changing colours of your surfaces after you've baked your radiosity, but they won't colour bleed and mix with the radiosity correctly. But if you are only making minor changes and tweaks to a scene after the fact, the radiosity cache is very helpful in helping you get swift render times if you need to go back and change something, at least something minor. Uh, one of the surface properties that you can change quite happily when using radiosity cache is reflectivity. If I just uh, do a little bake and render of this frame here, of this camera position. Oh, you'll notice that by baking it still doesn't take account of my altered light here if I do the render. You see, it still hasn't updated for my changed light color. It's still incorrect. You do need to do a full clear and rebake when changing lights. But if I grab the old ball there, I can turn up its reflection and without having to update the cache, it can render perfectly well. So some surface properties can be changed, some can't, but they won't have any knock-on effects into your scene. Also changing things like your ambient intensity, that will have no effect, that will not be taken account of, nor of course will changing the intensity of your lights, much like their colour. The one thing that you can change is your radiosity intensity, so you can pump your radiosity up and down without changing your cache. You can try changing the rays, but it won't do anything. And the multiplier, which if you change it, basically has no real effect. So, making changes after caching does depend on the changes. Some things you can and some things you can't. But for the things you can, it's really quite handy. Other little tricks that you can pull with the cache is you can disable things like ray tracing your transparency, reflection and refractions whilst baking the cache which gives a slight increase in render time. And then when you come to actually render, you can turn them back on again. There's little things like that that you can do. Otherwise, that pretty much wraps us up for this introduction guide to how to use LightWave 11's radiosity system and what each and all of the settings are for. So I hope you found this useful. I hope you'll go and check out the tutorial for animated radiosity available on CMI VFX. So until then, it's goodbye from me.